Tatars were one of many Parsi families whose ancestors had settled in Nausari, a small town in Gujarat. The head of the family, Nasarwanji Tata, was a religious, thoughtful man. Jamshedji Tata, like his father, was formally inducted into the Zoroastrian faith at an early age. The ancient beliefs and principles of his forefathers worked in Jamshedji's blood all his life. Years into it, he made his family motto, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Umta, Hukta, Uvrashta. Jamshedji was only 13 when he first entered the large, tumultuous town, which in the days to come, he would help turn into a great city. In 1864, the trade winds brought Bombay a cotton boom. The boom was fueled by the American Civil War, which had caused a blockade of the ships that brought American cotton to England. The bellies of the English cotton mills rumbled and creaked with deprivation. In the end, Indian cotton was needed to keep them and their workers alive. Jamshedji visited Manchester. He marveled at the efficiency of the mills there, the splendor of the new machines. But its industrial slums were as black and sulfurous as a medieval vision of hell. He looked into England's heart of darkness. Whole families never stopped working through the chilly days and nights of the north. Children scrambled for cotton fluff under roaring machines at a penny a day. It was appalling to be poor in England. After four years, Jamshedji returned home, convinced that the Industrial Revolution had to reach India if it was to prosper in the future. He wanted to build a cotton mill there, a modern mill, not the inhuman kind he'd seen in Manchester, but a mill where men could work as men should, struck the Imperial Darbar in Delhi, where Victoria was proclaimed Empress in absentia. On the day of this proclamation, Jamshedji inaugurated his most important enterprise yet, a great new mill complex. He thought it apposite to call it Empress Mills. These great structures are now just lifeless shells, but once they were a very important part of Jamshedji's success. The miserable conditions that had horrified Jamshedji in Manchester made him mindful of the welfare of his employees. He provided them with benefits denied to workers elsewhere in the world. Ventilation and humidifiers on the factory floor, accident insurance, a pension scheme, a provident fund, plus free dispensaries, maternity benefits, and even a crash for working mothers. In 1887, he founded Tata and Sons. He brought in two young partners, his son Dorab and his wife's nephew, Pratanji. Generally called RD, Tata and Sons prospered, as did the city of Bombay. But the center of Jamshedji's life was the great family mansion he built on the Esplanade. Esplanade House was the first house in Bombay to have electricity. But Jamshedji planned to generate enough hydroelectric power for the entire city. Nearly a century later, his dams and electric works still supply the power needs of the city he loved. Over the years, Jamshedji had visualized three great schemes, steel, electricity, and scientific education, three harbingers of national growth. They'd long been ready to fly, but each of them had had their wings clipped by the Raj. The situation changed dramatically in 1899. Curzon was forced by his superiors to liberalize the mining laws. This was the moment Jamshedji had been waiting for. 
for almost 20 years. He set sail for England in the summer of 1900. It was here that Jamchetji had an appointment to meet the Secretary of State for India, Lord George Hamilton. Hamilton was the only man who could issue orders to the Viceroy and know they would be obeyed. Here in the India office, Jamshedji looked to Hamilton to resolve his problems. Hamilton was actually quite enthused by Jamshedji's three stalled schemes. But interestingly, what excited him the most was the idea of India producing its own steel. Jamshedji told Hamilton that if he was to build a steel plant now, at his age, it would not be for personal gain, but only because his country needed it. He also told him of the many obstacles that had been put in his way. On learning of his differences with Curzon, Hamilton assured Jamshedji that he would write to the Viceroy to support him in all his schemes. Hamilton kept his promise. Now Jamshedji's only adversary was unconquerable, and it was age. But he rallied himself, as he'd always done, and set sail for America. This was a country of opportunity, new and raw. In spite of his failing health, Jamshedji spent a few remarkably hectic weeks in America, traveling to the major steel towns. But it was in Pittsburgh that Jamshedji found the man he needed, Julian Kennedy, the foremost metallurgical engineer in the world. Kennedy advised larger surveys and sent him to Charles Page Perrin in New York. Perrin had not expected the sudden appearance in his office of an Asiatic in exotic raiment. But something in Jamshedji's personality compelled the American to listen. Jamshedji said, I want you to take charge as my consulting engineer. Mr. Kennedy will build the steel plant wherever you advise, and I will foot the bill. Will you come to India with me? I was dumbfounded, naturally. But you do not know what character and force radiated from Tata's face. And kindliness, too. Well, I said, yes, I'll go. And I did. But it was his partner, Charles Weld, who arrived in India first, in January 1903. Spurred on by Jamshedji's steely resolve, Dorab Tata and Charles Weld searched the steamy jungles of central India for deposits of iron ore. After months of travel and travail, Charles Weld decided to call it a day. But Jamshedji adamantly refused to let him leave. In a letter to Dorab, He'd visualized the steel city he wanted to build. A city quite unlike the dismal steel towns he'd seen in America. The Institute of Science, which he tried doggedly to bring to birth during his lifetime, finally opened in Bangalore, seven years after his death. The names of many distinguished scientists, including a Nobel laureate, have been associated with it and the progress of modern India linked to it. 2,000 young researchers leave its great gates every year to fulfill his dream. Jamshedji was dead, but his son Dorab and Charles Weld fulfilled another part of his dream. Near the village of Sakchi in what is now the state of Jharkhand, Weld finally came across the perfect site for a steel plant. It had taken years. Construction work on the steel plant soon began. When Sir Frederick Upcott, the Commissioner of Railways, heard about this venture, he remarked that if it succeeded, he would eat every pound of steel rail it produced. In 1912, the new factory produced its first ingot of steel. Two years later, the First World War broke out. The Sakshi plants, working night and day, provided the British with hundreds of miles of steel rails for the troop trains on its eastern front. 
In 1919, after the Great War had ended, the Viceroy Lord Chelmsford made a historic speech. After thanking the Tatars for their contribution to the war effort, he spoke in particular of Jamshidji. This place will see a change and will no longer be known as Sarkji, but be identified with the name of its founder, bearing down through the ages the name of the late Mr. Jamshidji Tata. Hereafter, this place will be known by the name of Jamshidpur. Jamshidji died in May, and in July that year, a son was born to Sunni and Adi. He was named Jahangir. His parents and close friends called him Jay. The rest of the world was to know him as J.R.D. A year before the start of Tata Airlines, Sir Dorab's wife, Lady Meherbai, had died of leukemia. The following year, Sir Dorab also passed away. He left all his wealth right down to his pearl-studded taipin in a trust named after him. It soon endowed India's first cancer hospital in Bombay. Jay became one of its trustees and guided the trust for more than 50 years. In 1938, six years after Sir Dorab's death, Jay succeeded Sir Nauroji Saklatwala as chairman of Tata Sons. He was 34. Two floors beneath his office was the office of another young man, Naval Tata. Who was the same age as he was, Naval had grown up in deprived circumstances, having lost his father when he was still a child. When he was 13, Lady Navajbai Tata, Sir Ratan's wife, to whom he was distantly related, decided to adopt him. Having felt the chill of poverty early in life, Naval developed an empathy for the ordinary worker. This was to help him in what became his central mission, reconciling differences between management and labor. He did this not only at Tata's, but also on the international stage. At the ILO in Geneva, he spearheaded far-reaching labor policies and was elected to its governing council a record 38 times. Within the company, Naval played a unique role. It was the time of the license Raj, and constant dialogue with government was a critical part of management. Jay himself lacked the patience for this arduous task. But Naval was perfectly suited to it. His genial, down-to-earth manner melted bureaucrat and politician alike. For them, it was Naval, not Jay, who was the face of the Tatars. The Second World War started in 1939, only a year after Jay became chairman. It stranded a brilliant young Indian scientist from Cambridge, Homi Baba, in Bombay. Dazzled by Baba's ideas, Jay funded his research. The culmination was the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, the cradle of atomic energy in India. In the welter of tears, flames, and horror that followed partition, Jay's company, Tata Airlines, flew refugees from Pakistan to India and vice versa. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first Prime Minister, was grateful to Jay for this. All through his life, Jay walked with kings, but he never lost the common touch. He had a way of reaching out to people. <laughs> Even the street children near his office became his friends. He sent many of them to school, gave them clothes and toys. For Jay, human dignity was paramount, and the poverty that degraded it had to be fought. He used the weapon of the companies he headed to fight the war against poverty. He took Jamshedji's welfare schemes beyond the factories into the villages in the vicinity. During Jay's 52 years as chairman, Tata's expanded unbelievably. They entered areas as diverse as trucks and locomotives, chemicals and tea production, hotels and software development. But the growth was never at the cost of the core values first established by Jamshedji. As Jay put it, 
If our philosophy was like that of some other companies, which do not stop at any means to attain their ends, we would have been twice as big as we are today. But he added, we would not want it any other way. Under Jay, 80% of the profits of the parent company, Tata Sons, went to the Tata Charitable Trusts. These trusts in turn started vital institutions, the first of their kind in many different fields, enriching minds, adding to the quality of life. As Jay would say, what comes from the people must go back to the people many times over. Six years later, in 1988, he was honored with the Daniel Guggenheim Medal for Distinguished Services to Aviation. An earlier recipient had been Charles Lindbergh, the hero of Jay's youth. But public recognition alarmed him. In 1992, when he received the Bharat Ratna, India's highest civilian honor, his first reported reaction was, Oh my God, why me? In the last months of 1993, Jay developed pains in the chest. The doctors said he had angina. A fortnight later, he was admitted to the Geneva Canton Hospital. Like his idol and model, Jamshit Jitata, he was dying outside the country they had both faithfully served. What remained of Jay was entombed in the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris.